Um, <clears throat> I'm sure everybody uh, knows about the, the consensus problem. And uh, we say a blockchain problem is that the goal here is to build a ledger. It's also called state machine replication, all these different names in the literature. Right? But the um, high level idea is that we want a set of participants to agree on a totally ordered list of values. Right? Despite that, a fraction of the participants are malicious and they try to create disagreement right? among, uh, among honest participants. <clears throat> Right. And uh, in this talk, I'm going to focus on what we call layer one, right? meaning that we will focus on how to agree on these values. Right? We're not going to care about what these values represent, right? what, they, what they mean. Uh, that's, right? They have different meanings in different applications, right? for example, currency right? or storage, smart contracts, etc. cetera. Okay. And um, so it's called state machine replication because if we can agree on these values, then every participant can locally evaluate these uh, uh, commands or state transitions, and we will, right, all the participants will stay in consensus in sync with each other. Right, for example, here, um, the nice situation would be that uh, every transaction right, is uh, agreed upon, and everybody can apply these uh, monetary trans transfers and um, and agree on the total balance and for each for each account. And what the bad guy tries to do is to create a disagreement. Right? It, the bad guy tries to send create two transactions, right? both coming out of uh, his own account. Right? And if say the two honest users A and C, they decide on different transactions, right? then um, this is called a double spend attack. For our layer one, it's called the viol violation of safety or consistency. And so this is a, a very basic like, introduction about the consensus problem. I, um, the first thing I want to point out is that this is a classic problem. It has been around for at least four decades. I, so what's new about I, the Bitcoin or well, the whole blockchain uh, innovation? And more importantly, uh, it's not just about what's new. Right? So we can identify some new features of Bitcoin, right? but we should also ask, um, is it good? Right? Is, it, uh, is it important? Right? So there's some new features that are, may actually be drawbacks or limitations of Bitcoin. Right? Or they are nice, but not as important as people think. Right? So yeah, this is not directly related to my talk, right? but uh, I think it's a good exercise. To, and, and make it more engaging to right, just ask this question. Right? What, do, what do people think? Right? What do you think are good, important, and uh, novel in Bitcoin and blockchains? Right? Proof of work, permissionless, yes. That's uh, the first thing that people notice, right? that the Bitcoin system allows anybody to join. Right? And uh, I, I would say this is a, this is a novel property of Bitcoin, and it is a good property, right? but uh, I would also argue that it may not be as important as uh, touted, or as people believe it is. Right? The reason I say that is um, nowadays, the community is kind of moving away from proof of work towards proof of stake. Right? And uh, in my opinion, proof of stake is permissioned. Right? Just like the classic consensus algorithms um, Proof of stake is no more or no less permissionless than classic algorithms. Right? And the reason is that uh, in proof of stake, basically you have uh, voting power if you have coins right, in the system. Right? And the ledger wrote down, writes down every single coin holder, every single account holder. Right? So, and uh, it, if you want to participate, you have to purchase some coins from others. Right? So those people have to sell you, are willing to sell you their stake, right? and that is the permission you need to get to get in. The fact that um, newcomers can purchase stake does not make it permissionless. Right? Because we can also imagine for a classic, uh, fully permissioned traditional protocol, I right, say we have uh, 100 parties running consensus. A newcomer comes and asks, hey, 
does, does anyone uh, want to sell me your membership? Right? If they make a deal and a uh, new, new person comes in and some old member leaves, right, that's the same thing as uh, stake changing hands. Right? And um, so, right, but that's not to say proof of stake is, uh, has no advantage to, to classic consensus. Right? It does, and there's a very important one that uh, it supports dynamic participation. Right? In the sense that the total number of participants in a classic consensus is fixed. Right? When I say 100 participants, it's just this 100 participants. They have to, right? most of them have to be participating all the time. Right. Whereas in proof of work, proof of stake, uh, that's no longer the case. The universe of uh, total participants is very large, but any time there's only a small fraction of them um, actually participating, right? and it can go up and down. Right. And this is the Bitcoin's hash rate over time, right. and uh, we can see over the years it, it has increased a billion fold. Right. And that is not to say that the Bitcoin's Bitcoin's participation increased a billion fold right, because it's a combination of two things, more participants and also each participant having better hardware and better compute power. Right? But still, it's safe to say that the Bitcoin participation also increased hundreds or thousands of folds uh, since its invention. <clears throat> right, and you can also see there are also uh, cases where the participation suddenly drops by half or even more than half. Right, because the say the price uh, crashed and many miners are no longer interested, no longer profitable, right? or there may be government crackdowns on certain uh, mining operations. And um, <clears throat> and if we zoom in to um, to a smaller period, right, you will see that this sort of uh, sudden drops in participation or sudden increases in participation are actually fairly frequent. Right? When I zoom out, it's hard to see. Right? It's, uh, Everything is, uh, <clears throat> is uh, drowned out in the grand scheme of things. Right? But if we focus, right, if we zoom in to uh, it's about a few, a few months, right, you can see <clears throat> um, this, the Bitcoin demonstrated a phenomenon level of uh, robustness to participation, sudden changes in the participation. Okay. And uh, this is a protocol uh, I would say it's novel good and important in Bitcoin right, that classic protocols do not have. Why, why was that last graph of jagged? Yeah, I didn't really investigate. Okay, so first I should clarify that this uh, bottom is not zero, so it's not as dramatic as it shows, right, but still I think these two are about 40% drop. Um, yeah, I didn't uh, investigate this uh, every single instance. I, um, yeah, it seems that there are just uh, miners shutting down their system and opening up um, regularly. And um, right, since we're on the topic, right, I'll just uh, give one more example right, that um, certain properties of a Bitcoin may be novel but not necessarily good. For example, uh, it's commonly considered a new property in Bitcoin that security kind of increases over time. Right? When a block first shows up, it, you, you can't uh, finalize it yet. Right? When it's uh, buried deeper and deeper in the chain, you have more and more confidence that it it's, gonna, it's, it's going to stay. Right? So this is also a somewhat novel property of Bitcoin. Right? Um, but it's not a good one. Right? It leads to long confirmation latency. If we can finalize it right away when it shows up right, and don't have to worry about uh, it grows deeper and deeper, right, that's a better protocol. Right? So this notion of um, uh, long latency or security increasing over time is a property we, we would like to avoid if possible. Right? And uh, the longest chain style protocols that Bitcoin pioneered have this drawback and the classic BFT does not. Right, so that leads me to the central question I'd like to, we'd like to ask in this work. Right, can we achieve dynamic participation and low latency at the same time? Right, so basically combining the best of both worlds. All right, so then this is the outline of my uh, presentation today. Right, I'll first um, 
help review the longest chain style protocol and the classic BFT protocol. Right? And we will, uh, we will see why they have the respective trade-offs. Right? And uh, then I'll give uh, more rigorous um, definitions and models. Right? And then the main part of the talk is to extend classic BFT algorithms to support dynamic participation. Right? And uh, if we have some time left in the end, uh, we can I can throw some uh, open questions. Right? What else is novel in Bitcoin that we should try to achieve, right? or try to um, try to obtain without paying for its uh, prices and drawbacks? All right. Uh, so yeah, I'll go over this um, briefly. I, I, I think everybody knows how Nakamoto's longest chain consensus work. Right? Every uh, well, all the time we're doing some local random lottery. Each node is trying to solve a puzzle. Right? At some point, some node is going to solve it. And uh, the winner of that puzzle right, is allowed to append one more block to the chain. Right? And we keep doing that. And once a block is buried deep in the chain, right, we consider it committed right, or decided. So the this longest chain protocol, this lottery-based protocol, uh, is what allowed Bitcoin to have dynamic participation. Right? So suppose suddenly half of the nodes, or more than half of the nodes, disappeared, right? left the system. The protocol is still going to work. Right? At some point, right, one of the remaining nodes will solve the puzzle and become a winner. Right? And at some point, another winner is going to show up. Right? The rate of win winners showing up will be reduced but it will keep going. Right? And so this is, this is what makes the longest chain style protocol um, dynamic in terms of participation. Right? However, it is also the reason for its long latency. Right? And uh, the latency of longest chain protocol, I, I, I put a somewhat uh, complex formula here. Right? There are multiple factors that contribute to its latency. Right? The first one is this confirmation depth. We say that uh, you can only be confident of a decision if it's buried deep. Right? How deep? That is usually a security parameter. In practice, it's six. Right? But if you want to get a higher level of uh, security, you may have to wait for dozens of blocks right? or even higher if you want a cryptographic level of security. Right? <clears throat> okay, and this is uh, just a simple illustration. Right? If you if this uh, confirmation depth is set too small, then there is a chance that a higher chain is going to show up and overtake the, what you believed to, that, uh, to, be, to be the committed decision. OK, so there are other things that leads to the long latency of Bitcoin. Right. Uh, right. Uh, the second one is that there is a notion of block interval. Right? In Bitcoin, every block 10 per 10 minutes. And this interval needs to be set to be considerably larger than the network delay, right? than the message delay upper bound. Right? Otherwise, uh, your chain would not grow nicely as, as a chain. Right? Otherwise, uh, then there are concurrent solutions found, concurrent puzzle solutions found all the time. Right? And your blockchain will become a block tree. And uh, that reduces the fault tolerance of the protocol. Right? So the higher fault tolerance you want, right, the higher latency it will be. Right? So uh, we say, we, approximately, we always say Bitcoin tolerates minority, right? but uh, it's not really 50%. Right? It's more like 49.7%, uh, something like that. Right? Um, some, follow, some later systems, like Ethereum, pushes this further by reducing the block interval. Right, and then they're sacrificing their tolerance right, to something like 45, 46%. Right, so we can't, cannot push that too far. Right, and uh, the last term is what I'll call the actual participation level. Right, so if you think about it, <clears throat> in a Bitcoin-style system, we, can't, we kind of have to make a guess that how many people are around, right, how much computation power is around. Right, and then we need to set a difficulty to make sure that the blo a block shows up on average about 10 minutes. Right. But if that guess is off, for example, if uh, suddenly 80% of the people 
left the system, 80% 80, 80 of the computation power left the system, then you wouldn't get uh, one block every 10 minutes. Right? You will have to wait for like 40, 40 minutes, 5, 50 minutes for one block to show up. Right. And so if the participation level is a lot lower than what you expect, right, the latency will increase. On the, and on the flip side, right, these two are kind of uh, uh, two sides of the same coin. Right? If the participation level is a lot higher than what you expect, right, then you would lose uh, fault tolerance. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So uh, on the other hand, we have classic BFT protocols that's um, following the line of work started uh, pioneered by Lamport and um, um, shock stack and peace, right, and all the way right, to Paxos, PBFT. Right, all of these protocols, they roughly speaking, follow a paradigm where we have a leader. Right. One node serves as the leader, the leader makes a proposal, and the other nodes vote on the proposal, right, usually in two rounds, and right, sometimes three rounds. Right. And at the end of uh, the two rounds, if both rounds of voting succeed, meaning that uh, enough votes are gathered, then they will make a decision right, right there. Right, and usually enough votes means one half of the total participants or two thirds of the total participants. Right, and that's what we call a quorum threshold. <clears throat> right, and uh, hopefully you can see this style of uh, classic BFT protocol has very good latency. It's going to make a decision in a few rounds. So it's a constant amount of latency. However, it doesn't support dynamic participation because it expects to receive one half or two thirds of the total, uh, total number of participants to vote. And if, say, half of the people leave the system, then you will never be able to get a quorum of votes and the protocol loses uh, its liveness. Okay, now uh, it's coming back to the central question of this talk. And we have these two styles of protocols. One have dynamic participation, but not uh, low latency. The other has uh, low latency, but does not support dynamic participation. Right? And uh, the main purpose of this talk is to show you a new protocol that achieves both at the same time. Right, let me just very quickly uh, mention some uh, related works that uh, attempted uh, this, the same problem. Right? But uh, right, some of them reduce the latency, but doesn't quite get the constant optimal latency. Right? And uh, there's, uh, right, there's one work that did get constant latency, but it's uh, targeting a unknown static participation, not really dynamic. OK, so now uh, let me make things a bit more formal. Um, more rigorously, we have a set of n potential participants. Right, so this is permissioned because the list of participants is known to everybody. Right, and uh, we have a PKI. Everybody knows everybody's public keys. Right, um, for now, I'll just keep the set fixed. I, I don't anticipate any problems to extend it to a changing set to model stake changing hands, right? but, but we haven't done the full analysis, so I don't want to make claims there. <clears throat> okay. uh, at any time t, only a small nt participants are active. Right? The rest of the participants are inactive. Right? And we do require an honest majority among the active. Right? So less than half of nt can be adversarial. Okay, and uh, any participant can transition between inactive and active at any point. Right, so this is the dynamic participation part. And uh, they can do so without giving any advance notice. And it can happen in ad adversary's control. Right, the adversary can choose to, say, shut down this set of nodes and bring up another set of nodes. Right, um, without any constraint. 
I think technically we do have a constraint that the attack, uh, the attacker cannot shut down everybody, right? and nobody remembers what happened in the past. Right? That's not okay. Right? But as long as uh, there's one honest node staying there. Okay. So, <clears throat> yeah, I also remark that um, we currently assume that the adversarial participant never goes inactive, right? but this is more of a technicality um, because. If it's, if it's a bad node, since it's Byzantine, it can do anything, right? it can give its secret key to another bad node right? and then goes inactive. Right? That's as if it never goes inactive. Right? So um, what I'm trying to say is that the protocol I'm going to show you should work fine if the adversarial participation actually fluctuates. Right? But we don't know how to model that. Right? We don't know how to how, we, we don't know how to model an, an adversarial participant goes offline. If it reveals its secret key, the advers adversary can only go up, cannot go down. Right. Yeah, what, but yeah, what I'm trying to uh, convey is that if we have a magic way to, to say that this 100 adversarial nodes suddenly half of them are gone, right, only 50 remain, and the other, those who are gone did not reveal their secret key, then our protocol should be able to handle that case. The adversary goes up and down. Right? It's just that we don't know how to model or formally forbid these bad nodes from giving up their secret keys right? or giving up the future messages they would have sent if they were uh, active. Right? Some, um, tech, yeah. So that's why I think it's a technicality. Um, in terms of the model, right? not, a const, not a limitation in terms of the solution. Okay. <clears throat> so yeah, so that's a short summary of our model. N total participants, and only a fraction of them are active at any point, and it can change uh, at any point. And the problem we're trying to solve is, uh, is a kind of a variant of state machine replication or atomic broadcast. Right? Participants send values and they want to agree on the ever growing sequence of these values. Okay. And there's one more important assumption we need to make in the model. Right? That is, there is a known upper bound on the message delay. Right? Or this is the synchronous model. And uh, this has been shown to be necessary. Right? So um, Andy and the team in the audience formalized this. Right? If there is no such bound, then essentially the network can partition. Right? The two partitions should both make progress because the protocol is supposed to support dynamic participation. Right? They do not know the existence of the other partition. Right? They thought the other partition just went offline. They need to keep going on their own then there seems, no, seems to be no chance in solving the problem. Okay, so um, yeah, this is the, oops, okay. Yeah, otherwise the <coughs> dynamic participation is impossible. Um, I think I took out that one remark that uh, Joe was asking. Right, what's the difference between this model and the sleepy model? Uh, here we are assuming that a node, if it went offline, it knows it went offline. Right? It's a, it, a node went offline by knowingly shutting down its computer. Right? Um, the last time I talked to Elaine, she said um, she assumes that a node does not know if it's online or offline. Um, yeah, I have some reservations about that model, right? both its applic applicability and uh, um, whether it's solvable. But that's, that's why I choose not to call it a sleepy model. Okay. So um, <clears throat> now coming back to, to the classic um, BFT, right, we're going to try to extend it to support dynam dynamic participation. Right? And here is the main challenge. Right? The main challenge is that it's based on a static quorum. Right? So the quorum size is chosen based on the total number of participants. Right? For example, half of n. So um, if 
very few nodes are on online, then you will never be able to get such a quorum. Right? So we have to extend this notion of a static quorum to a dynamic quorum. Right? That a quorum should be defined based on the actual participation, right? not the total population. Right. However, the problem is that we don't know the actual participation. Right. So the best we can do is to define a quorum threshold based on the perceived participation. Right. Meaning that I will ask the active nodes to send the message, I, I am awake, right. I am here. And then we count how, how many I am awake messages there are, right. and that is my perceived participation. Right. And the quorum size, which is how many votes I require, right, will be set to be, say, half of the perceived participation. Right. And again, uh, I use big N to denote total population. I use small n to denote the actual or perceived participation. My perceived participation may be different from yours. Right? That's the biggest problem we need to solve. Okay. Right. So, um, yeah. So the challenge is that malicious nodes may announce them partially, right? So I tell Tim, hey, I'm here, but I don't tell Andy, right? So they perceive different amount of participation, right? That means they will set different quorum thresholds, okay? And the issue with that is then um, this a set of votes, which we also call a quorum certificate, is no longer transferable, right? So for example here, node A, perceive the higher participation level, right? so therefore node A require uh, uh, more votes to be, a, to be in a quorum. Right? So if there are like five votes here, so node B may consider that to be a quorum. Right? Node B will be happy and make a decision. However, oops, if node B send this quorum to node A, node A will say, no, 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 that's not enough, right? That's not a quorum, that's insufficient number of votes. I'm not going to commit. And that will be a big problem. So <clears throat> the, the central challenge in this, in this work, in this talk, uh, is to restore this notion of certificate transferability in the context of dynamic quorums. Okay, so let me uh, say a bit more on that. Right. Certificate transferability is uh, right, very important in classic BFT, right? but it's just so fundamental and so trivial there that we usually don't think about it. Right. And um, so now, once we're aware of this problem, right, we can, hopefully I can um, give you some intuition that this notion of uh, transferability is routinely used everywhere in classic protocols. Right. Um, it's very common that in BFT protocols, we have something like this. If one node makes a move, then every honest node weakly support that move. Right. It's like uh, if you want to get a paper accepted, one reviewer needs to champion it, the other reviewers need to be not against, right. need to be neutral or Right. Weak supportive, weakly supportive. Right. Um, right. There are many examples. In, in the classic protocols, it's very common that we have uh, mechanisms to ensure that if one node makes a decision, then every other honest node kind of uh, locks on that decision. Right. You can think of it as a soft decision. Right. Or if one node makes a soft decision, then everybody has seen that proposal. Um, right, something more concrete, if one node cast their round two vote, then we want to ensure that every other honest node has received round one votes, right, something like that. Okay, and this can be uh, formalized with, uh, with the notion of a graded agreement. Right, um, over there, in, right, if you're familiar with the problem, if you're not familiar with the problem, it's okay. Right, it doesn't, it's not that important. Right, but uh, if you have heard about this notion, then it roughly says if one node outputs a value with a grade one, right, meaning that with confidence, 
then other nodes should output that value with lower confidence. There are many such steps in a traditional BFT protocol, right, and we usually don't, think, don't even think about them because it's so easy to do, uh, to ensure this in classic protocols. Right? Because all you have to do is to design the protocol such that a node makes a move only when it receives a quorum of votes. Right? And then you ask that node to forward this quorum of votes to everybody else. Right? So they will also uh, recognize that as a quorum of votes. Right? They received it a bit later, so they will not be the strong champion of that move, but they will weakly support that move. Right? So all of these, uh, all of these uh, things can be trivially guaranteed by this notion of uh, certificate transferability. Right. So uh, now if we can restore this uh, notion of transferability in terms of, uh, uh, in the context of dynamic quorum, right, then we can mimic the traditional protocols and basically um, follow their ingredients and follow their recipe and we will get a dynamic participation protocol. And the key technique is uh, uh, what we call a time-shifted quorum. Okay, so step number one, uh, or if you've seen graded agreements, then well, we'll try to do graded agreement here. Uh, so step number one, every node will send a pre-vote message for, for the value it supports. Okay, and also they will send a wake one. Okay? This is the message that announces themselves, I am participating. Um, Ah, also, yeah, I'm assuming lockstep rounds for simplicity now, uh, that the execution is divided into rounds. All the message sending happen at the beginning of the rounds, and by the end of that round, all the messages sent in that round are received. Right? So this is uh, kind of an idealized model. We, don't, we can get rid of it, right? but uh, I'm going to assume that for simplicity, uh, for ease of presentation. Okay? We're, also going to, uh, we're go also going to ask everybody to forward all the newly received messages. Okay, so then in round two, uh, first we will do the forwarding. Right? Everybody will forward these messages they received in round one. Right? Additionally, we'll do a counting. Right? Everybody will count how many pre-vote messages they received by the end of this round, by the end of the second round. Right? And we'll call that uh, variable V1. So bear with me, I'm dumping you uh, the entire protocol on you, uh, but the, hopefully the intuition will be clear uh, afterwards. Right. Now, third round, they will do an, every node will do another round of counting. Right. They will count again how many pre-vote messages they received. Right. So this is the total. Right. So V2 is certainly greater than V1, right. or, or uh, greater or equal than V1. Then they're also going to count how many awake one messages they received by the end of the round three. Okay. Uh, and additionally, they're going to send awake two. Right? That's another round of announcement that I am still here. Okay. Now, lastly, uh, if V2 is more than half of M2, right? that is the, right? they were going to send a vote message. So this is saying the number of votes meet the threshold of a perceived participation. Right? Then they were going to do a, a proper vote. You can think of this as pre-vote as the first round of voting and the vote as the second round of voting. Okay. Now lastly, they're going to count yet again. Right? The number of uh, awake one messages received by now, they're going to call that M3. Uh, and then they're going to do their dis make their make their moves. If V1 is greater than half of M3, they're going to make their proper move. Right? If number of votes is larger than half of number of awake two, they're going to do the weak supporting move. Okay. So why does this work? Right? Let's now bring in another node. Right? The property we want to ensure is that if one node makes a strong move, then everybody makes the weak move. Okay. Now let's first, uh, let me first point out some um, important observations. Right. So 
notice that the v1 of any node will be no greater than the v2 of any other node. In this case, let's say this node has a v1 here. That's no greater than the v2 that any other node got in the next round. This is because we're doing the forwarding. Right? So if this node seeing v1 pre-votes, it's going to send them to everybody else. Right? So by the next round, everybody will, at, will see everything this, this previous node has seen. Okay. Oh, that's clear. Right. With the same logic, uh, the M2 of this upper uh, of a node is going to be no greater than the M3 of any other node. Also because of forwarding, right? Anybody, anything that has seen, was seen here will be seen over there. Okay, uh, now we are pretty much in business. Oops, okay. <clears throat> now if any node makes a strong move, so their V1 is greater than half of V3, uh, M3. Right. Let's say this bottom node is making a strong move. Now, because of these two inequalities, right, if you look at any other node, their V2 is greater than this guy's V1. Right. And their M2 is smaller than this guy's M3. So if this V1 greater than M3, half of M3 holds for this one node, then V2 greater than half of M2 will hold for every other node. So that will make sure if one node makes a strong move, then everybody will vote. If everybody votes, then everybody will see that votes is more than half of a week two, and so everybody will do the weak support. Yeah, that is, uh, yeah, that is pretty much the key technique in this work. Right. Then um, we kind of get, got back this property that if one node makes a move, everybody is weakly supportive of that move. Um, now, okay, so yeah, I'll skip the detailed protocol, but from there, the time-shifted quorum can be used to build a graded agreement, right, and the traditional BFT can be viewed as a series of uh, graded agreements. Usually, we don't view them that, that way because it only complicates things, right, but uh, in, once we're in a dynamic situation, right, it's helpful to break down a traditional protocol as a series of graded agreements, right, and then we plug in that uh, previous thing I just showed you. Right, and then we'll combine that with a random leader election using VRF, VDF, right, or any other mechanism. Right, then we will get a consensus protocol with expected constant latency. Okay. Um, but the, it's not super efficient concretely, because right, our graded agreement has seven delta latency, and we need five of them, right, and uh, our total expected latency ends up being a fairly large constant. Right, so, yeah, so some future directions. Right, can, we, can we get a better uh, concrete latency? Right, and can we improve, can we reduce the communication cost of this protocol? Right, right now, we're doing a lot of forwarding. Right, everybody is forwarding every single message. That is uh, fairly expensive. Right, um, right, having said that, I, I find the protocol very interesting because right, this is the first uh, um, BFT protocol that handles dynamic participation right, and, sub, uh, and achieves a constant latency. It's a very short list of uh, some questions that I think are interesting and open, I, um, motivated by this, uh, right, this, this question I posed in the beginning. Right, what else is novel, good, and important in Bitcoin? If we, if we can identify these properties, then we can ask, can we get them? without paying for the proof of work and longest chain latency of, uh, um, of Bitcoin style protocols. Right. Um, to give you a few examples, the, the longest chain protocols likely handle uh, intermediate model between synchrony and partial synchrony. 
right? but we don't know what it is. Right? We, we haven't been able to formulate such one. Right? Um, so some, some examples, some other examples, longest chain protocols should be able to tolerate some message loss, right? but we haven't been able to formalize them. Right? Same thing for sparse gossip network. Right? Uh, is it an ad hoc trick, right? or can we prove that in some model it, is, it probably solves consensus? And lastly, incentives is also a, um, a big question with a lot of open problems there. All right, uh, yeah, that is the end of my presentation. I'm happy to take questions. Have you thought about uh, extending this or the relationship with like a communication, uh, you know, like a sublinear communication model where you randomly sample who's participating in every round? Right, That's, we haven't. Yeah, is. we haven't tried. Um, it seems compatible to me. Right, I, I guess the well, yeah one challenge is then. Do you do you put a threshold? Do uh, do you determine the size of the community beforehand? Right? What happens if the participation drops below the community yeah. size? Especially because it's interesting how in something like Algorand or I guess anything with VRS where uh, you kind of randomly pick who's eligible to participate in each round, you end up with a random number of participants that you don't really know, mm -hmm. right? Like right. Nobody knows the number of people who. Because VRF hits the threshold, so it's kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. It's related to like you don't really know how many people are right. active. Mm -hmm. And in that case, it's not that people are asleep; it's just like they didn't get a winning ticket. They didn't. Mm -hmm. You just right. have some probabilistic notion of what to expect. Right. I guess they, they could also have gotten a winning ticket. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That that that's a yeah good good observation. Uh, but I, I will point out that it is. Uh, I think there is a difference in terms of how unpredictable it is. Right? So with VRF, the, you have a fairly good idea uh, that it's going to be very close to the target you set right? because of a law of large numbers. And, uh, they, guess, but they also don't want it to be, they don't want it to be so big that the law of large numbers really kicks in, right? Because they want it to be like it is, right, I think I mean, they're usually like 100 or 200 nodes. Right. Right, but I think at that level, law of large numbers uh, somewhat apply, right? And you, you may yeah. get a, like 10%, 5% uh, error, right? But uh, here we're really trying to target right, very wild swings. And so the steps of the protocol, is it, is it, is it, is it, do you need this set of active nodes to stay fixed across those steps? Um, yeah, that's a great question. We don't need it for safety, but we do need it for liveness. Mm -hmm. right. In during this period, um, so okay, yeah, because the claim I made here is that if one person makes a strong move, then everybody makes a weak, weak move. That's the safety uh, lemma, right? Uh, but it doesn't say that there will be one person making a strong move. Right? That one, that part needs the stable period. Right? So in, in that sense, we're kind of. Uh, Adopting the mentality of partial synchrony, that we're going to maintain safety, even if it's uh, wildly swinging, right? but uh, we're going to get liveness only when there is a stable period 